Boker Tov Givrin. Boker Tov. Ma Shlom Kim. Oh, a few toves here and there, and I don't know if Dr. Grisanti's class responded any at all, but I didn't hear any raw. So therefore, I can report to Dr. Grisanti that his students are at least doing well or they're silent, one of the two. All right. Now, we're going to begin this morning by going back to our devotional area of Psalm 103. We've covered verses 1 through 8 thus far, and this morning we want to talk about verses 9 through 10 just to walk through and take a look at the Hebrew and try to understand it exegetically and expositionally. The first line is Lo Lanetzach Yariv. Everyone repeat it after me. Lo Lanetzach Yariv. The Lo is a negative. It's the objective negative. Uh, it means uh, not. And with Lanetzach you have a Lamed preposition attached to a noun that is often used adjectivally. Netzach that means forever or uh, for a very, very long time. And Yariv is a Cal imperfect third masculine singular from a middle vowel verb, Reeve, that means to contend, especially to bring a lawsuit against someone. And so the uh, text here says, not forever will he contend. Not forever will he contend. In other words, he will not contend forever. There will be an end to contention. God will have a time in which he contends with Israel because of their rebellion and disobedience, in which he brings a lawsuit against them. This is the same type of thing you see in Isaiah chapter 1, where the witnesses are heaven and earth and uh, even the animal kingdom, and he brings his accusations, his charges against the nation of Israel. In verse 18, he says, come now and let us reason together, which in other words is basically saying, uh, let's come together right now, and you present your case, you respond, you defend yourself. And so we're, we're being told here that God's not always going to contend. The idea is that contention, that lawsuit will come to an end and judgment will be executed. It is presently delayed, but it will not be delayed forever. The second line of verse 9 is, Welo le'olam yitor. Everyone, repeat it after me. Welo le'olam yitor. Again, we have the lo, we have a conjunction and, connecting it to the preceding line, the two halves of the verse are exactly parallel. The negative's parallel. The uh, prepositional phrase referring to time is parallel, are parallel. Let olam, the lamed preposition, plus olam, meaning age. And again, it has the same meaning by context and comparing it with la netzach, the idea that it is forever. And yator is from the root natar, a pay noon or initial noon verb. The noon has been assimilated in the imperfect. That's the reason for the doubling doggish in the teeth. Notice the holum over the wow, and the hirik under the yod prefix indicates it's a cal, imperfect, third masculine singular. Natar has the idea of to refrain from, to hold back, to guard. And so not forever will he guard. And the idea here is to hold back anger to guard his anger, to refrain or to restrain, to restrain himself. So these two lines then emphasize this negative aspect. And we continue with the negatives in verse 10. Lo kachetainu asa lanu. Uh, there's been a change in the accent here, bringing it forward to the ayin and comments on asa instead of asa that is normal because of the accent being fronted on Lanu at the pause where the Athnak is. And so let's read this one again. I'll pronounce it one more time, then you repeat it after me. Lo kachetainu asa Lanu. Okay, everyone? Lo kachetainu asa Lanu. Not according to our sins. Chata, here referring to sin, the kaf, preposition that uh, is used as the comparative, the comparison, like or according to. And the pathak under the kaf is due to the hatif pathak under the chaith because you cannot begin a word with two 
half vowels in a row, whether they're hatef vowels or whether they're simple schwas. And so it takes the corresponding half vowel in place of a simple schwa under the kaf. This is not an article here. According to our sins, the a tseri yod after the aleph shows you that we're dealing with a masculine plural construct noun. The new suffix is the first common plural pronominal suffix. According to our sins, asa, the verb asa means he did, he performed, and lanu is the lamed preposition plus the first common plural pronominal suffix. So it is not according to our sins, he has dealt with us. The lamed here being translated as with because of the meaning by context for asa. He's not done to us according to our sins is one way you could say it, but that's kind of rough and awkward English. It does not smooth. It does not sound very literary. And we, we use asa in the sense of the deal and the semantic range of asa is so great that it can take in the concept of to deal. And so it's a better translation. Not according to our, sons, our sins, excuse me, he has dealt with us. And not according to our iniquities, using aon in place of cheta here. The same thing, except we have a feminine plural construct with a tsere yod used as a connecting uh, syllable before the new of the first common plural suffix, gamal, Cal perfect, third masculine singular, just like asa was. And then alenu, al preposition, in the poetic plural construct form that is often occurs in, so that accounts for the tseri yod, and the new being the first common plural pronominal suffix. I'll read that one more time. Welo ka e o no te nu, gamal alenu. Listen to it one more time. Welo ka e o no te nu, Gamal Alenu. Let's all pronounce it. Welo Kao no Tenu Gamal Alenu. And we translate this and not according to our iniquities. Has he rewarded us? The Al is not translated because Al following Gamal just introduces the direct object. So we don't translate rewarded upon us or rewarded against us. Now, as we look at these two verses, and we look at these four lines, all beginning with a negative, it helps us to see that there's a cluster of phrases here utilized to describe what God has not done. And he is holding back his anger. He is not judging. He is demonstrating patience and long-suffering. He is a God who is a forgiving God, we found out in the uh, first part of the psalm. And uh, now we find out part of the mechanism of his being a forgiving God and a patient God. As we look at the poetics of these phrases, they're exactly parallel, exactly parallel. So we have synonymous parallelism. Lo la netzach yariv means the same thing as well lo le olam yitor. It's not really a technical progressive parallelism where you have two different thoughts brought out. It is two different ways to say the same thing that God will not forever refrain from judging. And the first line says it by he will not contend forever. And the second one says he will not refrain, understood his anger forever. So if you added his anger in here, in your translation, it would be in italics because you're adding it to the text. It is not stated, it's only implied. And it is not part of the grammar, nor is it necessarily part of the lexicon for natar. Then we go to the 10th verse, and as we look at it, we see an exact parallelism with an extension at the end as compared to the first, the, the two lines of verse 9, because we have that D section brought up there with lanu and alenu being added that lengthen the lines. Perhaps this is in order to lengthen the time in which the concepts are being expressed to give the hearers or the readers a greater amount of time to think about the truths that are being focused on here. The purpose of parallelism, remember, in uh, poetry, Hebrew poetry, is to repeat a thought to give us time to meditate 
on that thought and to understand it better and more completely before the poetry moves on. Here we have four lines that help us, that slow down the pace of the poem and cause us to concentrate on this one aspect of God's character and his activities. When we have the low negative, remember the low negative is the subjective, or the, excuse me, the objective uh, permanent negative. And it's uh, stating an indicative fact that is being negated. It's not al, the aleph pathic lamed negative. Al is used often with the justives. It is the subjective and it is the temporary negative that has the idea of don't in this particular situation do something. But the low here is emphatic. And it's the idea that God will never refrain forever. He's not going to delay judgment forever. This is an absolute fact. It is an objective fact that he will not do so. And he does not, he has not, he does not, and he will not deal with the nation of Israel completely or totally according to their sins or their guilt. And it's the same with us, we find out, on the basis of not the Old Testament but the New Testament. God's grace intervenes, and rather than facing the penalty we deserve, we then are allowed the grace of God. Now you say, well, what if the person is an unbeliever? They're still experiencing the grace of God and his patience because God hasn't stricken them dead immediately. He allows them to live. He allows them the opportunity to hear more of his word. He is patient. He is long-suffering. He has his time. If it wasn't for his patience, they would be dead at their first sin, at the first rebellion, at their first example of unbelief. As we look further at this, besides the negatives, notice how each of the lines after the negatives begin. We have an alliteration. In, the, in verse 9, each of the two lines begin with a lamed. And each of the two lines in verse 10 after the negative begin with a kaf. Both of them are prepositions. Some have pointed out that this is almost uh, an alphabetic type of arrangement, except it's in reverse order because Kaf comes before Lamed in the alphabetical order. But that alliteration after the negation, which is an assonance of its own, a repetition of its own, continues that sense of unity that ties these two verses together. And then the switch from imperfect verbs in verse 9 to the perfect verbs in verse 10. Why is that? Remember the imperfect verbs are those that look at an action internally with regard to its progress, not externally looking at the action as a whole. When we have yariv, it's not the idea that, well, it's just a simple fact that God will not uh, contend forever. It's not just a simple fact. It's not just looking at the action from the outside as a whole. It is looking at it at the inside, and it looks at the progress of the action. In this context, it is probably the idea that he will not continue to contend forever. That fits the phraseology, it fits the grammar, and that is probably the idea and why the imperfect is being utilized. And the same with the idea of refrain, he will not continue to refrain. It's the idea of repetition. It's the iterative sense or the frequentative sense of the imperfect that is being used and is being looked at. It's not just the simple fact of the action, it's the interior progress of the action. And then the perfect is used in verse 10 because as Chisholm brings out in from exegesis to exposition, the perfect states the simple facts of the matter, the simple fact of an action or a state. And as Walt Ken O'Connor bring out in introduction to uh, biblical Hebrew syntax, the perfect looks at the action as a complete action, and they specify that does not mean completed. It's complete. It looks at it as a whole. It's not saying here that God is finished with this action. It's not talking about the fact that it's past tense, because that's a function of context and not a function of verb form. The context tells us what tense this is in. Again, as Chisholm brings out six times in his book from exegesis to exposition. Asa, he has uh, not dealt with us according to our sins. 
is just looking at the simple fact of the action as a whole without regard to the internal progress. It's not the idea that he continues to do that. That would be the imperfect. It's not the idea that he has initiated it or that he is concluding it. It is simply a statement of fact looking at it as a, the action as a whole, like the constative errorist in Greek. And by the way, I, I must bring in to class sometime for all of you, and we'll do that in 603, definitely, uh, what Mounts, or not Mounts, excuse me, Daniel Wallace has to say in Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics concerning the nature of Greek verbs. And in some regards, that uh, those Greek verbs in his description are almost parallel exactly to the Hebrew verbs and their functions. Uh, anyway, Gamal, the same thing. The rewarded here is looked at as a simple fact, uh, looking at the action as a whole without regard to any internal progress of the action. Simple statement of fact. The progress of action is only needed with regard to that that is time limited or time oriented or time modified that you have in verse 9. Verse 10 is not time modified. It's looking at the simple fact. It's almost like it's characteristic action by God. And some identify these as characteristic perfects. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not reward us according to our iniquities or our guilt. And uh, I would say there's a very strong argument to made, be made for that. That's a characteristic perfect the idea of looking at it as simple action, describing the nature of God's activities. The last part of this has to do with those two prepositional phrases on the end of each line of verse 10. Lanu and alenu. Notice here we have also an assonance. The rhyming of those two endings, nu and nu. But notice that that's carried on throughout both of those two lines because we have kachataenu and we have kaonotenu. So this is a characteristic uh, type of sound to have when you have a first person common plural pronominal suffix used repeatedly in any context. Is it used here intentionally to give that type of rhythm or sound or rhyme? That's difficult for you and I to tell. We're looking at it not as the original writer. We're not looking at it even as the original hearers of the language. It sounds like that. And if it was intentional, then it's a unifying aspect of that. But I'd be cautious about emphasizing that area. I would just emphasize the idea of our, the repetition, the mere repetition of our is something that needs to be talked about because it's talking about something that is personal. It's not talking about third person there. It's talking about us. Remember the psalm began with the psalmist in a soliloquy with his own soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me. Bless his holy name. When you're looking at that, this is a switch. We've gone from the soliloquy that is a one-person monologue to the idea that he is included in a community that has experienced the grace of God in such a fashion that they need to remember it. And that's the focus as we come to verse 10. All right, any questions before we go to diagramming? Any questions? By the way, I might point out here that if you are doing a logical diagramming or diagrammatic analysis for a passage like this, just putting it into these forms of parallel lines, these cola, the two-part sections of poetic verse is probably all you really need to do for diagramming. You can see then visually the parallelism between the lines. And because of the orientation vertically, you can see the parallelism of the negatives in all four lines. You can see the parallelism of the prepositions that begin the second words in each of those lines. Perhaps to improve upon this diagram, you might want to move Yariv and Yator, which notice I've moved Yariv over. There's extra space after La Netzach in order that you might visually see Yariv and Yator as directly parallel to each other. They're vertically oriented. Uh, perhaps I should take those two and move them over so they're vertically oriented over Asa and Gamal. 
and then you'd have all the verbs oriented in this particular section. But that's a matter of subjective choice. That's a matter of the one doing the diagramming, whether he wants to have that type of visualization, if that's of benefit to him or not, okay? And looking at and understanding the flow or relationships in the passage. Any other questions before we go to diagramming, diagrammatical analysis? All right, let's do it with that. If you have your computer open, and if you would open up a, a Microsoft Word document or whatever Word processor you utilize, software. And as we do that, as you uh, get something there, we're going to be working in uh, the area of uh, 1 Samuel 16, since we have it there in front of us. And I'm going to change the, uh, oops, get this on here. I'm going to change the uh, resolution of this so that we can uh, all see it clearly up here. The first thing you want to do when you're preparing a uh, Word document for doing diagramming is to make certain you put into that document a heading that identifies what your passage is. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to type in here 1 Samuel. Chapter 16, verse 1, and I'll leave a hyphen, and we can fill that in later as to exactly how far we get and as we go today and on Thursday. The second thing we want to do is to insert a table format. The way to do that is to go up to your table menu, drop down that menu, and go to the insert of that and say insert table and it will give you an additional window, window that will ask you how many columns and how many rows. I have mine preset to five columns because I found out through years of experience that five columns works best for diagramming Hebrew text. So I'm, mine is already preset for that. And for two rows that's just to give us something to work with more than one line. You could put more in there if you wished. And when I return then, I obtain something that looks like this. The very first thing I want to do next from that then is to select this table, go to my format menu, go to the borders, and get rid of all the borders around the cells. You do not want those there. You want to remove them. And it will still leave you a gray outline so you can see the cells. And uh, if you can't see the paragraph markers there, that's because you may not have it selected or chosen up here on your tool bar. And if I deselect that off my tool bar, you see the paragraph markers disappear. I like to have the paragraph markers because I like to see whether I'm left or right uh, justification or centered justification. I like to see how many lines I have in. I like to see how many returns I have in. I like to know if I have a return that should not be in such as some of you put in the middle of a bibliographic entry and uh, therefore you negate the ability to use the sorting command for your bibliography to put it in alphabetical order because you have inserted a return. So I watch for that that way. The, the next thing I want to do is to again select this table and to select a right justification orientation. So I justify right, which switches everything to the right-hand side because Hebrew goes from right to left. And then I'm going to go to my font menu. And in the font menu, which you can access on the keyboard with a control D, says Times New Roman regular 12. I want to change that because I'm going to use Bible works. So I'm going to put in B-W-H-E-B-B, -B -B, which is the Bible works Hebrew font. And I'm going to leave it regular, and then I'm going to change the uh, size to 18, because size 18 is the equivalent of size 12 for the Times New Roman. Uh, some like to use 16 to keep a little bit smaller and have a little bit less space between lines of text, but 18 works quite well. So Bible works Hebrew, B-W-H-E-B-B, -B, regular, size 18, return, and that means that every, everything I pit, I, I put into that document now within the table is going to be faced with that font decision. Now before I go further I'm going to save this as a document on my desktop. 
so that if anything happens, I have it there. It's going to ask me if I'm going to replace. Yes, I'm going to replace what I had there before. And uh, then I'm going to open my Bible works. It'll take a minute here to open. If you're using another Bible program for your Hebrew Bible, you can open that and use it. And uh, you may want to find out if you uh, uh, have a different font. And instead of using Bible Works Hebrew font for your table, you'll want to select the font that you have in your Hebrew Bible program. Scott? How did you get rid of the lines in your table? I went to Format, right. Borders, right. selected None. And then return and return. Now, your, your lines that you say, you'll still have lines. They'll be light gray lines that will remain. They won't totally disappear. Okay. All right? Okay. Okay? That's so you can see what, what you're working with and where you're at. Now, in Bible Works, what you want to do is uh, go to your tools. And I just use an Alt T to select the tools menu. And then you want to use the C for copy center. Copy center, all right? That's down here just to show you where it's at. It's right there if you're used to using the up and down arrows to find it. Go to the copy center. When you've opened the copy center, you get a window like this. And the next thing you want to do is go to range of verses. And then to the range itself, we want to put in first Samuel. Remember, in Bible works, you can only insert three characters for identifying the book name. Don't go beyond it. You can't put in one S-A-M. You put in one S-A, one S-A, 16, colon, one through, I'm going to put in 10 for the time being. And then go down to versions, and under versions, type W-T-T. W-T-T is the Westminster Tagged Text for the Hebrew Bible, for Biblia Hebraic Stuttgart Tensis. And then you go to copy to application with this title, and it will, you'll have a window come up, and one of your latest documents that you paste anything into will show, and you have to go and select the particular document you want it pasted into. Mine is 1 Samuel 16, Microsoft Word document. And then you can return or, or hit copy, and it will show up in your document. Okay? Now, the next thing I'm going to do is to go to my table format. I'm going to put my cursor over the top of the vertical line that separates the last two cells, select it to where you have a dotted vertical line show up, and move it, manipulate it, to the right, to where I can then insert the verse number there on the right, so I can keep a verse number in perfect order outside of my Hebrew text and keep my Hebrew text vertical line by line. And I'm just going to extract that from below here and paste it in above, verse number one. And then I'm going to delete all this stuff that is not needed Remember not to go too far or you'll delete the accent and the pathak under the first letter. Always make certain when you're pasting that you are beyond that you are including that vowel. One of the ways to make certain is hit the right arrow to where your cursor drops to the next line. That tells you you had everything. And then bring the cursor left arrow back one and you have it. So we begin with Wa Yomer Yahweh El Shemuel. Notice that above Shemuel, we have a Rabia. Always when you're diagramming, watch for the major disjunctive accents. What are the major disjunctive accents? What is the major logical division of a verse? What's it marked by? Athnak. Athnak. That's your major marker. What are the two accents that are primarily used for quarter markers? Zakev Katon which looks like a schwa, but it's up above the word. And what? Rabia, the one we have here. Rabia means quarter. All right, so those two are usually the quarter markers. They mark the halfway points of the halves 
of the verse. Sometimes they mark more than half points within the first half. They can mark thirds or they can mark uh, fourths within the first half, depending on the length of the uh, verse. And so we're going to go to the first disjunctive accent all the way through. And notice I'm going to carry it on through one space and only that one word space. I'm going to cut and I'm going to paste into that first box to the left of the verse number. Okay? Wayomer Yahweh El Shemuel. Then Yahweh said to Samuel. Now after that, we have what Yahweh said to Samuel. Ad matai. Until when, literally? How long? Atta mit abel. How long will you mourn El Shaul? How long will you mourn Saul? Or how long will you grieve over Saul? Now, because that is something that he is saying, and by the way, as I get down here, I'm going to add a couple of more rows, because if I adjust any cells, I don't want to have that affect all the rest of them. So I'm going to pick this up, then what he says, and I'm going to make certain I've got the vowel, and add matai atta, and when that happens, if you have mine set like I do, it uh, takes in the return. I don't want it, so I'll go from the left to make certain I don't get it. And I put it in here. And you'll see right away there's not enough space to take everything that I want. So I'm going to select these two cells here. Go back to my table menu. Go to merge cells. Merge those two cells to where they are now one. And this is why I put extra lines below because I don't want that same thing happening on the ones below because I might need those cells in other places. And then go back and pick up Mit Abel El Shaul. And go back up. And paste it in. You'll notice that it's too long for the length of the cell, the width of the cell. So I'm going to select that one cell and only that one cell because I only want to move its borders. And I'm going to, I have space here after El Shemuel so I can move that to the right and I'm going to move that one border to the right. So then it fits. I have to highlight that cell if I want to move only its border. If I don't highlight that cell, I end up moving all of the cells and columns for that one border. Okay? If I want to finesse that a little bit more, if I, uh, when I hold this down, if I also hold down the Alt key, then I can adjust that very minutely to where I want it exactly. All right? Now notice that what... God says, what Yahweh says to Samuel now, is located to the left of the statement that says, so Yahweh spoke to Samuel. So that the direct discourse is left of that introductory statement. All right. Now I'm going to go back down to pick up the next part of it. But I have rejected him. By the way, let me remind you also that remember Shaul had the Zakef Katon over it. It's a strong disjunctive accent. It marks those interior portions inside the halves of the verse. And we're going to have two of them here because we have a second one here that is related to wa anim asti. All right, those of you in Dr. Grisanti's class, you pronounce that meastiv because he uses the modern Hebrew pronunciation rather than classical Hebrew pronunciation. And so you have to get used to that, and you'll have to get used to my pronunciation when you come into uh, OT 603 in the fall. But I have rejected him. Now, where do I want to place that? I have how long will you mourn over Saul, but I have rejected him. 
Notice the use of atta, the personal pronoun, in the line above it. I would like, for personal reasons, to help remind me of the idea here of the contrast between the action of Samuel and the action of God to make certain that atta and ani are aligned. Therefore, I'm going to select that cell. I'm going to move the left side of it because I know it's not going to contain the whole thing if I move the right side first. And then I'm going to move this over and I'm going to hit the alt key so I can finesse it a little bit and try to figure out about where it will come. And I think right about there will do it to where atta is directly above wa ani with vertical orientation from the right hand side of the word. If I want to parallel me'asti with mit'abel, I must insert a word space, but you see it overshoots the mark. So I select that word space, I go back to my font menu, and I reduce the size to nine for that one word space, and it brings it into alignment. So I manipulate the size of word spaces to help me with vertical alignment of elements that I want vertically aligned. And that way I can see at ta directly above wa and ni, I can see the U of Samuel with the I of God directly contrasted, and I can see the actions themselves contrasted, mit abel, the mourning, grieving of Samuel, and the rejection of Yahweh. Okay? That's part of the reason for diagrammatic analysis, is to visually demonstrate relationships within the text that are exegetically and expositionally significant. All right? That way we can see them and we can understand basically what's going on. Now we go to the next line. And by the way, before I go down there, I'm going to get some more lines in my table and get rid of this one return there that I don't need to have. Go back to Mimlok, Al Yisrael. Notice there's an athnak under Yisrael. From reigning over Israel. Now, this obviously goes with the first logical half of the verse. Therefore, it doesn't go with what comes after the athnak. Therefore, I don't want to go back out to the right margin of the diagram. I want to look carefully where I want to place it. Mimlok is a min preposition plus the cal infinitive construct, construct of malak, to rule or to reign to be king. Prepositional phrases, even if they are attached to, or instead of nouns, attached to infinitive constructs, are adverbial in nature. Adverbs modify what? Anyone? Adverbs modify verbs, modify other adverbs, and modify adjectives. Adjectives. All right? Adverbs modify verbs, adverbs, and adjectives. I look in the immediately preceding context because this phrase has an athnak in it. It belongs to the preceding context to see what it might modify. Where do we find something for it to modify? Anyone? It modifies me'astiv. It modifies, I have rejected. I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. Therefore, it is an adverbial modifier of that preceding verb, so I am going to diagram it to where I show that adverbial modification. I delete it from there. I go up here. I paste it into here, and it is too large for that, and I'm going to manipulate that cell only. I'm going to move it over a little bit here and move it over a little bit here. And there I have it set to where it is halfway underneath me'asti. So you, we can see that it modifies that verb. 
It is an adverbial modifier. We do the same thing when you do grammatical diagramming. In grammatical diagramming, if you have ma'astiv, and you have it on a line like this, then your modifier comes below it. All right? And that's all I'm doing, is I'm doing the same type of thing, except I'm not using those lines. Because we're not doing technically diagram, uh, grammatical diagramming. If we do grammatical diagramming up here, we really end up in a mess. Because in grammatical diagramming, remember that you have a subject goes first with a full line through the text, and an object is a single vertical line here, and here we have the object is here, and we have the subject is here in Hebrew. If you're going to divide all that up and diagram diagrammatic, you're going to chop the Hebrew text up. Not only that, since the Hebrew text is especially sensitive to word order and to emphasis and to parallelism, we do not want to touch the word order of the Hebrew. We want to leave it intact. We never, ever want to change the order of the Hebrew text in our diagramming. Because if we do, we destroy the visual clues of seeing where there is focus or emphasis due to word order. So we want to avoid that at all costs. So we don't diagram this way, and therefore we're diagramming this way. Now, as we go further, the next thing we find is a command. And I'm going to pick up this command, and I'm going to move it down a line so that it can be kept together there. And fill your horn with oil. Malé, the PL imperative, masculine singular from malé. Karnaka from karen, horn, with a second masculine singular pronominal suffix. Shemen, the noun for oil. And here it's behaving as an adverbial accusative. It's a accusative that is showing the content the material with which the horn is to be filled. Notice the rabia over the shemen. That tells us a quarter marker, so we're going to stop there at that location with that disjunctive accent. Pick that phrase up, and it's still what God is saying, so we're going to put it here. We're going to select this cell, and we're going to make it match the cell above that began with ad mat matai. All right? There we have it. Directly vertical to that. We know it's vertical because if we put a, uh, our cursor on that, we can see the vertical dotted line that is perfectly continuous with both the right-hand margin of the cell in that second line that we want it parallel with and the one we have below. This imperative is beginning a new thought in what God is saying to Samuel. Therefore, we're bringing it out to be equivalent to the prior thought. He first asks him the question, how long? And now he gives him a command, fill. Fill your horn with oil. And then we have, and here I'll need another row here, or two to make certain I can maintain the configuration I've set up. And go, lake, the cal imperative, masculine singular from halak. Esh lacheka is the cal imperfect, first common singular with the second masculine singular pronominal suffix. I will send you, el yishai, to Jesse, Beit halachmi, the Bethlehemite. And notice we have a zakef katon over that. So I'm going to take that whole section. In fact, I'll go back and make certain I have the schwa under the wow. And take that section and bring it up. And it is going to go in here. Obviously, not enough room. And uh, one of the things I want to do here, select this entire cell and make certain it is consistent with the one above. So we have parallel imperatives. And then I'm going to tie that with the preceding cell by merging, selecting both of those so I can go to the table menu, the merge menu, merge the two. Go and I will send you unto Jesse the Bethlehemite. All right? So we're all set with that one. 
And then we go down further and we have a key clause because I have seen or I have selected and we're going to go in here go here fill your horn with oil go because I have selected this key clause is modifying it's giving the cause or reason so it's an adverbial clause for the actions for the imperative so I'm going to manipulate the border of this to where it comes halfway underneath the two imperatives above it because I have seen among his sons for me a king I'm going to bring those up here put them in here and as I do that obviously it's not going to fit here so pick these up again go back to my uh, table menu merge and we've got it and then as we come in here now and I'll put this down here because it'll help to maintain if I put this on the last line now and change it I won't have to select the font used again it'll be all right for that and we begin verse 2 now the very next verse begins with Yomer Shemuel so Samuel answered Samuel replied Therefore, God's speech is finished. What do I do with direct discourse in diagramming? I put a box around it. So I'm going to select, I make certain my cursor is below the table so it doesn't foul things up. I'm going to select my draw menu, the box from it, and I don't like that drawing uh, palette. I ignore it. And come up here, put in a box. Uh, use my alt key to manipulate its, its borders where I want them. Uh, it needs to be emptied, so no fill for the box. And then I can uh, think that's all right there. I want to manipulate the upper a little bit here, like that. There I have the box for the direct discourse surrounding the uh, statement that God made that highlights that and then prevents me, and I'm going to save it at this point, it prevents me from confusing it with the main line of the narrative. That's the purpose of putting a box around dialogue. So it's immediately demarcated. It is marked out. It is separate from the narrative uh, main line, the actions of the Wayik toll verbs. All right? So we do not confuse verbs inside that box with relationships to verbs outside that box. Because the verbs and clauses are related to each other inside the box and inside the box only. They're not related grammatically to anything outside the box. Okay? Because direct discourse is its own context. We've finished 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. We have the direct discourse in a box. Uh, we have not gone to those steps of making certain that we have all of the possible relationships diagrammed. On Thursday, we'll take a look at how we can modify this further. But note already some of the things that it teaches us that can be of benefit. When we look at that direct discourse, it is divided into three things, three lines that are at the same right-hand margin. That tells us that those are three major grammatical relationships within the discourse. The first one is marked off by the question, ad matai, how long? The second and the third are marked off by imperatives. The first imperative, fill. The second imperative, go. Now, as we're looking at something like that, since we have a question, an interrogative, and we have two imperatives, and since the athnak occurs under Yisrael at the end of the interrogative, then that would seem to indicate that this is really a two-part discourse. So for outlining this for preaching purposes, then this would be like A for Ad Matai through Al Yisrael and B for Malay and following. And then under B, we would have one, Malay, fill your horn with oil, and two, as another subpoint under B, of go, I will send you. 
and uh, we'll discuss the grammatical implications of that relationship in that line later on. And then the cause, the causal down there, the key clause is subordinate uh, because it's defining the imperatives. It's giving the reason for those imperatives. And in some situations, you might want to make that point number three, that you have the, uh, uh, the imperatives, uh, each one, and then you have a cause or reason for it. But that remains to be seen as you're going through. But you can visualize how your outline looks because you have diagrammed visually the relationships. And this is the benefit of doing logical diagramming. It helps you to observe the way the text is structured. So we now go to verse 2. And as we go to verse 2, getting rid of that number and the space after it, we have Yomer Shemuel. We have it is going to come up here. And we're going to put it here where it's directly underneath Yomer Yahweh. So this is the second Vayik Tol, or as Dr. Grisanti would say, Vayik Tol, in this narrative framework. These are consecutive actions. They are sequential. Samuel did not speak first. Yahweh spoke first. That's the reason of Vayik Tol. Vayik Tol's major function is sequential. And so the sequence is that Yahweh speaks, and then we have Samuel speaking. And then we have what Samuel said. Now, since we're going to deal with what Samuel said, and we already know that we have a direct discourse above. If we want to make the discourses parallel, we'll take the first cell there and we'll move it over to where it uh, has a border the same as the discourse above it. And then we'll take this. Ake, a lake. Sounds a little bit uh, like assonance or rhyme to it. Ake, a lake. Uh, how should I go? And we take that. It has a zakef katon above it. So we're going to plug it in right there as to what Samuel said. Uh, we're going to add a couple more lines here so that uh, we don't run out of them. We're going, pardon? When, when you get your uh, cursor to the end here, you just press the tab. And the tab takes you over the next line and adds it. So the tab is how you add the lines. It adds automatically, and it'll add exactly what you have above it. That's why I keep putting in an extra line that is empty, so I maintain the overall formatting that I began with. Okay? All right? It, by the way, if you have any questions we're going along, please feel free to ask so that we can uh, make certain we answer them. Yes, David. What I use to blow up the size of the screen, I go up to the uh, View menu, go to the Zoom menu, in the zoom menu, the uh, percent, select the percent. I use 150% to enlarge it. Okay. It's just a, it's a little bit difficult to see the text from where I'm not sure if else. Not so, large yeah. enough? Yeah. Okay, let's go to 200. Thank you. How's that? A little better? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Wish some of you would have said that earlier. You know, not all of you have 2020 vision. I don't. Nowhere near anymore. All right. So, ache a lake. And we go down and uh, we have we shama Shaul uh, because Saul will hear we and he will kill me. So, we're going to take Shaul and I'm going this way so I make certain I get everything and not the return. Uh, how shall I go for he shall hear uh, that's going to end up here somehow, and so I'm going to put it in here. And if we put it as uh, directly parallel to what is above, or if we put it subordinate, if we make it subordinate, we want to move it over. So I'm going to select that because I'm going to go ahead and make it subordinate and move, it move that cell over, that border over, and then move this border over to where we have it that way. Pardon? Uh, yes, because the next is another verb with a wow on it. All right. Now, notice also with this next one, we have an athnak under it, but we also have a psalmic that is down here. The psalmic. That psalmic uh, stands for the idea that this is a, uh, uh, a closed 
paragraph, a closed section. The Hebrew Masoretes had the concept of a psalmic and of a uh, pay being used to identify sections. And uh, the closed section has the idea of a major paragraph or section break in which you would start then on a new line. And the uh, pathak is patuak, open, means that you put extra space in there. You open a space in the line, but you don't start a new line. So it is not as major a break as the psalmic. And so that is a good clue besides the athmak that we want to keep it separate from anything that follows. So we're going to pick that up. I need to pick up the spa word space after it as well. And bring it up. And I'm going to put it in here. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to bring, uh, for he shall hear and kill me. I'm going to, uh, just let me get that. There we go. Select that. And bring it over to where it is directly vertical with the preceding one. And now we have that done. And as we go down further, we're going to end up with Wayomer Yahweh. Notice the revia over Yahweh, a major disjunctive accent. And we know that that's going to go in here. So now I need to put a box around what Samuel said. And so I'm going to make certain my cursor is outside my diagram. Select my uh, drawing tool for the uh, box and come up and put it in here. Then empty the fill, put no fill, and then adjust it slightly here. And now I have the box for what Samuel said. Okay, everyone clear with that one? Any questions about that? I have subordinated Weshama and Weheragani under Elik because it appears to me that these are subsequent to their consequences of Samuel's going. How shall I go? How should I go? Because since Saul will hear and kill. And hear and kill are two parallel actions coordinated, and they are of the same relationship. John? For the diagram, and then, so we have, no, and so and so said, and then that conversation, and then so and so said, and that conversation. And then Correct. If, there was, if there was narrative in between there, we would go to another. And we will come to that narrative in this context and show you how to deal with it, yes. Okay. okay. Now, this also helps you in translation. Because remember, in English, new speaker, new paragraph. That's the English method of recording dialogue. When you have a new speaker, you have a new paragraph. If you have more than one verse that the same speaker is saying, you don't divide it into paragraphs unless it's a long speech, a long discourse that has several different topics. Then you divide the speech into paragraphs. But in translation, normally in a short dialogue, the way we have it in normal narrative, where you have brief conversation and the responses back and forth, then you'd have one paragraph for what God says, one paragraph for what Samuel says, and then another paragraph for what God says in response to Samuel, as we come down through here. Again, this is the third dialogue consecutively, in order, sequentially, because these are Wayik Tol. And the Wayik Tol verbs... Primary usage is to demonstrate sequence. Whether chronological or logical, it is sequential. It is one after another. Now what God said is next, and he says, uh, Eglat Bakar, a heifer of the herd, literally. A uh, herd here, Bakar, is just a classifier. It's just letting us know that it's a domestic animal that runs in herds. It's letting us know that basically it's in the category of oxen or of cattle. It's bovine. And therefore, uh, eglath bakar can be just translated as heifer because in English, heifer is used primarily of cattle. It's a bovine term. So uh, we have a heifer, tikach. You should take or you will take, biyadeka. 
Notice the, hot, the uh, Zakef Katon. The Zakef Katon, the Yadeka, is a quarter marker. It is a major disjunctive accent. And therefore, we're going to stop with it. Obviously, it is not intended literally. He's not to take a heifer in his hand. His hand isn't that big. He's not that strong. He's not Samson. And so this is obviously used as an idiom that means with you. With you. In your hand means by your hand or means with you. It's just an idiom. So it's what God is saying. So we're going to go here. We're going to put it in there. And we're going to uh, do something here with uh, both of these to merge. Go to the table menu, the merge menu. And then I'm also going to bring the uh, border of this cell. out to where the others are. And I'm going to continue with a couple more lines here. And then we find something fascinating. Because the very next word has another zakef katon. Another major disjunctive accent. But notice the nature of that word. Wa'amerta. That is a cal perfect second masculine singular from Amer, you shall say. Or, in a context like this, it could be interpreted as an imperative. Say, speak, command, say here in this context, and say. So we're going to have a quote within a quote, which presents us with an interesting problem. All right, we're going to put that here. I'm going to bring it over because it is parallel to the preceding part of what God has told Samuel. It is the second part of what he is instructing him. And he is to say something. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to select this cell. And I know it's going to be a saying context. So I'm going to bring it over to where I have some room to work with, and it's going to be to the left. What, what he is to say is going to be the left of the verb say. And then go down and pick up when he says here, for sacrifice, lis boach, or to sacrifice, for sacrifice, la Yahweh, to Yahweh, bati, I have come. That's what he is to say. So we'll put what he has to say here. And then we go to verse 3. Because it's next. And we're going to go back up here. And get another couple of lines in. By using our tab. Delete the number and the space after it. Wekarata, and you shall say, or you shall, excuse me, call, or summons, or invite. Context alone will tell us how to best translate this. Le Yishai, Jesse, Batsavach, into the sacrifice. All right? And we have a Afnak. So that's the middle part of the verse. So we're going to stop right there. That's the logical midpoint. And we're going to put it in here. We're going to pick this up and move it to where we can have it directly parallel with we'amerta, because it is also a uh, cal perfect second masculine singular. Obviously, the same person's being addressed by the same person. Yahweh is still speaking. He's still speaking to Samuel. And we'karata is parallel to we'amerta. It doesn't go parallel with Litzboach because Litzboach is an internal thing. It is a matter of what he is to say. And by the way, while we're there, let's deal with that. Let's take care of it. This line that I've got highlighted right here is a quote within a quote. If you're translating this, you begin with, you shall take a heifer with you by beginning that with a double quote. Double quote, you shall take a heifer with you and you shall say, comma, single quote, for sacrificing to Yahweh I have come, period, 
end of single quote, continue on, and you shall summon Jesse into the sacrifice, etc. God continues to speak. When we get to the end of what God says, we'll have the final double quote. So it's a quote within a quote. Now, I highlighted just this one cell because it's simple. It's, a, it's just one cell. And I'm going to shorten it up so it doesn't take up too much space. I want to try to preserve space here. And then because it's only one cell, I'm going to go to the border menu by going to format, format, borders, borders is right there, borders and shading, and select box. But I want to have a line different than a solid line because a solid line marks the entire discourse. So I'm going to choose a dashed line as a box around. You can see that shows up here in my window. Hit OK. And now I have, you can see it there, I have a dashed line around the discourse within the discourse. All right? And when we finish all of what Yahweh is saying, we'll put a solid box around it. But that dashed line will tell me, keep that, keep those verbs separate from the verbs that are inside the main box. Because it is a separate discourse. They're not related. Leitz Boach has nothing to do with any other verb inside of what God is saying. It only defines bati. I have come. For what purpose? In order to sacrifice. In order to sacrifice doesn't belong with amerta, you shall say. It doesn't have anything to do with tikach, you shall take. It is grammatically related only to bati within that one dialogue, within that one discourse. So that helps to visualize that and keep them separate. And we anoki, I shall odi eka, I shall make known to you, eighth esher, what ta say you should do. All right. So I'm going to pick up that next, and first of all, I'm going to get rid of. Uh, I'm going to bring that down. Actually, I won't because that line's too long and will mess things up. So I'm just going to go ahead and bring it up here. And I'm going to do this, pull this over to where it is parallel with what's above there. Get rid of this return. That's another reason for having the returns visible. You can see what you're getting rid of. And then we have eighth, I shall make to you what you shall do. That's the direct object. That's the object clause for I will make known to you, to you, you, the second mask is going to put on the suffix, is the... Uh, uh, indirect object. Put that in here and I know it's going to create a problem because it's too long. I'm going to go in here, select this, go back to the table menu, merge menu, and get it merged. And then go down and add another line in. And then, umashakta, and you shall anoint li for me. You shall anoint for me. Notice the zakef katon over the li. Therefore, that is a major disjunctive, so I'm going to take that, I'm going to bring it in here, put it in, select it, and bring it over so it is parallel with the preceding. Again, get another line in here. And then this is eighth esher, whomever omer, I say, eleka to you. Again, the eighth shows you a direct object. Anoint for me, and this person who is anointed is the direct object. Put it in here. Go ahead and select this and the cell here. Go back to the menu to merge. And I've got everything done for that. And as we look at it, the next verse, which would be here, verse 4, is... So Samuel did what Yahweh commanded. Wa-ya-as, cal imperfect, third masculine singular, wa yiktol verb from Asa. Shemuel, the subject. Uh, eighth esher, diber Yahweh is the direct object, whatever Yahweh commanded. 
And so we're finished with the direct discourse. So let's go back and get our box. I need to do it this way to get space here to work with. All right. I want to get a box in here. Yeah, keep doing that. There we go. Uh, select my box tool and go up and put a box around all of this conversation, this dialogue, what Yahweh has said to Samuel. Adjusting it a little bit, then emptying it so that it's a blank box with no fill and it shows up just fine with uh, your discourse. And then go back to verse 4 and I'm going to pick this up and just move it down below so we have it so Samuel did even though we have a revia over Shemuel the direct objects are kept on the same line with the verb and the subject in uh, this method of diagramming so we'll just take that whole thing all the way through the Zakef Katon and we'll put it right here and when something jumps like that, you just have to move it back where it belongs. Sometimes it doesn't always behave because when you change something, something will jump around. Just get used to it and correct it. All right. And then the tab. So we have the first tol verb in the narrative framework that is not Wayomer. We had three dialogues. We had Wayomer Yahweh El Shemuel. Yahweh said to Samuel. Samuel responded, Wayomer Shemuel. Yahweh responded, Wayomer Yahweh. And now the response is action instead of speaking. So Samuel did whatever. Eighth Asher can be used as whatever can be used of what, which, that which, deber, Yahweh commanded. And then the next verb, this is where we go with then with this uh, context of what we have. We have a, uh, a next Vayiktol verb, continuing the narrative framework. Vayavo, thus he entered Bethlehem. The next way toll verb is after that, but at this point we have an athnac mark, marking the logical middle. So we'll put that in there. And then we have the next one, the next way toll verb. I'm going to go ahead and move down. The elders of the, uh, so the elders of the city trembled at meeting him. And so the elders of the city trembled at meeting him. Pick that up, bring it up here, and put it in. Need to get an extra line before I adjust this in here. All right, notice we have Wayaas, Wayavo, Wayeherdu, all parallel to each other. These are actions, they're sequential actions. Samuel did whatever Yahweh commanded, so he went or he entered Bethlehem. The first Wayiktol is almost as a summary that begins it, and this could be taken as internal. And then you have after he entered Bethlehem, or when he entered Bethlehem, the elders trembled at meeting him. And then we have something very unusual. We had a plural verb in Wayeherdu. That is a Cal imperfect third masculine plural from Harad. It's third masculine plural because you have the subject is the elders, Zikne Ha'ir of the city. As the elders of the city, they're the subject. You have a plural verb. They're in agreement. But then we have Wayomer. Wayomer. Then he said, or thus he said. 
Obviously, it is not Samuel speaking. How do we know that? Because of what he said. Shalom Boeka. Shalom Baeka. Who is the Ka? Who is the second masculine singular? Samuel is the singular individual here. So if this individual who is saying this is addressing it to Samuel, then the individual speaking can't be Samuel because he's addressing Samuel. So it has to be one of the elders acting as the representative or spokesman of the elders is the one who is speaking. So one of them understood of them, so we put it in italics, one of them said, do you come in peace or is your coming peace? Literally, peace your coming? It is an interrogative. There's no interrogative marker. There's no interrogative hey. There's no interrogative pronoun being used. How do we know it's a question? Context. In Hebrew, questions are answered by taking the key word in the question and beginning the answer with the key word. Notice what happens in verse 5. Wa yomer shalom. Lisboach la Yahweh bati. Peace. For sacrificing to Yahweh I've come. That's his answer. Shalom is his answer. So the previous shalom is a question. Have you come in peace? So we take this and take the verb here. Wayomer. And we're going to put it in here. Pull this down. Get us a few lines here. And then we're going to take what was said. Have you come in peace? Is your coming peaceful? And we're going to put it in here. And we're going to bring the border over where the other dialogues were. Like that. And we're going to go down to the next one, verse 5. And we pick it up. Wayomer, and he responded. This is obviously now Samuel who is speaking this one. And I'm going to pick this up this way and bring it down here so I can get all of it. Peace. I'm going to separate it out. Notice the revia over shalom. And I'm going to put it in here. And let's get a couple more lines here so I can work with it. And I'm going to move this over. And I know the next line is going to be the same. So I'm going to move them both this time at the same time. And move them over to where they're parallel with the one above. Therefore, the two shaloms are directly above each other. And then for sacrifice to Yahweh, I have come. And put that in here. And because it's running over, I'm going to go ahead and merge these two. Going back to table menu and merge. And you can begin to see how it's going to pan out here, how it's going to work. And so the next thing to do here to make certain I keep this, and it's, we're about to the end of our time anyway, we'll stop here. But I'm going to take that box again, and I'm going to put it around. Or I actually don't need to. I don't need the box at all because the fact that... Uh, We're down here to where I can just use the uh, border. Since it's one cell only. And I'm just going to put a border around that. Go to the format menu. The border menu. And put in the box. And return. And now I've got a box around that. You'll see that it's darker than the uh, line that is gray. And if this single box like this isn't dark enough, I can always make that darker by going back to my border menu here and uh, selecting a, uh, here we go, the thicker line down here and make it a one point line and it'll show up a little better that way and it's more consistent perhaps the others because the others are one point line also and that means I should do it up here for this particular box as well if I make this a one point line Instead of half point, it'll show up better. 
for the dashed line. Now you can see the dashed line a lot better. All right, we're going to save that at this point. We'll return there when we come back on Thursday. On Thursday, what I want to do is take this one step further and show you how we can manipulate some of the text to show a few more of the more uh, finessed relationships syntactically in the diagramming. In the meantime, you have this diagrammatical analysis handout that you received this morning. Go through it. Take a look at it. Some of the rules that are followed in how we diagram. Look at the diagramming by the numbers, treating Exodus 1526 going through step by step, because we'll go over that in OT 603 as an example of how to do it, but you can look at that ahead. And then to look at what you're get working toward, look at the last page where Psalm 15 is diagrammed, parallel to a homiletical or at least an exegetical English outline of the text to show you how these work in concert with one another. And if you're using the table format, like what, what, like what I'm giving you here, it's very easy to put the English in on the left-hand side in the table, parallel to the divisions within the Hebrew text. And I'll show you how to do that on Thursday as well.